or with the now, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of organization designs that I will be uh, drawing with unfixed elements. This is what you could say uh, the typical safe or less business or product group. There are a couple of agile teams, uh, the yellow ones, uh, team A, B, and C, uh, and perhaps maybe a service team that does maintenance stuff or whatever on the same kind of uh, product they have their own product areas neatly cut up uh, and they are end-to-end -end value stream teams i prefer to call them um, uh, value stream crews uh, I, I like the word crew because there is this notion of uh, in it of this being temporary you're on a mission together to get something done i i prefer that word over team to be honest because I had heard people refer to their entire organization of 10,000 people as a team. Well, <laughs> that's not really a team, if you ask me, but um, your mileage might, may vary. You can use any word that you want. The yellow ones are value streams. That's what you're probably familiar with. This is agile stuff, scrum teams, Kanban teams, and so on. However, sometimes you have an exception. Sometimes you have a kind of team that goes across, like agile coaches, for example, or scrum masters, um, maybe product owners. They are the purple uh, teams. I usually refer to these as the value, uh, sorry, the, the facilitation crew. They facilitate the yellow ones getting their work done basically so they they help them out and they help them with coordination perhaps uh, and other things now in the back you see back-end guild and front-end guild this is known for many of you probably people want to get together around certain topic whether it is a ux meetups or or I don't know, uh, TDD, across the various teams. So you get together and um, uh, as, a, as a guild, you, uh, you talk with, uh, with each other. I usually refer to these as a forums because a forum is a place where you go and talk and maybe sometimes make a decision with each other about how to get work done. Now, finally, the blue one at the top, you see the management team. And this is often not mentioned or addressed in agile scaling frameworks where they intentionally do not discuss where the managers go in my opinion it is necessary that you show where managers should find themselves and also where they should stay out so managers are in the management team they have a responsibility for managing the system not the people is what i always say managers do it all so they should not be on any of the other teams, not in the yellow ones, not in the purple ones. They manage the business unit uh, uh, and, uh, and stay out of everywhere else. Second example, this could be a microservices kind of business. I'm thinking of uh, Spotify, Netflix, uh, LinkedIn, the kinds of companies that make, make big uh, SaaS platforms where all the teams operate independently, but they work on one big thing together. So in this case, there could be an imports and exports team, for example, that together do integrations. There could be another team that is the email team. They do the e email campaigns. Uh, so again, they could be scrum teams, Kanban teams. And then I have two different kinds here, the, the, the Purple, sorry, the, the pink one is the customer experience team. This is something that I have noticed in the Agile community over the years that basically what we have done is we have replaced vertical silos with horizontal silos. Um, there are still silos in the Agile community. It is just teams focusing on their product area and sub-optimizing their area and not communicating enough with the others that focus on other areas. So you have these islands of optimization uh, in, in your company. I have noticed it when I work with a great app of a bank and the website is also fine, but navigating between the app and the website is a disaster. 
Well, you can see those are obviously different teams making different products and there's not much coordination between them. For that, I suggest you may want a, a customer experience team that goes across and removes all those holes in the customer experience. They watch the entire customer journey. And, and not only development teams uh, uh, should be a part of that journey, but also service, support, even marketing and finance have touch points with customers. And sometimes the pain is there in, the, in, in what marketing and sales do with, with customers, for example. On the other side, the yellow one is the supplier experience team. That would be an option for businesses that rely heavily on business partners, such as Netflix, for example. I can imagine that some people take care that the, 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 the TV producers, uh, the studios, etc., are treated well because uh, Netflix has competitors and uh, they have to make sure that the Paramounts and, 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 and whatever uh, offer their series to Netflix and, and not to others. So that's the supplier experience. Probably there's a platform team as well underneath because in these kinds of businesses, they, ha they have teams specializing in, the, in hosting and infrastructure, et cetera. So that scrum team and Kanban teams can operate fast that they can do a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. So there's other teams focusing only on, on the basic infrastructure in the company. Third example, an outsourcing, outsourcing business. Um, these are the typical companies that you might find in Eastern Europe or in, the, in, the, in India or whatever, who work for clients in the West. They have multiple project teams. Each of them has a different customer. Um, so there's not much coordination needed between these teams. They have their own backlogs. They have their own stuff to do. Maybe there is project management and account management that goes across these teams because um, there is planning that needs to be done across the various projects that these people are involved in. You might also have a, a team of specialists, uh, machine learning, for example. A couple of people who, uh, who specialize in an area and you don't have enough of them to just distribute them across all the projects. Makes no sense because many customers have no need for machine learning in their, in their uh, project, but some do. And for that, you might have two or three experts and they form their own little team. They sort of hover around and offer their help uh, on an as needed basis. And maybe there are, again, forums like an Android development forum and an iOS development forum or, or something like that. Fourth example, an incubator business. Um, there are some big companies, enterprises who have their own incubators, their own units with at the top an investment team. That's the management team. They make investment decisions. And then multiple teams, the startup teams, they are again end-to-end -end Scrum or Kanban teams trying to make new products. And actually in this case, they compete with each other to some extent because they're trying to solve the same problems maybe in different ways. Um, and it's a friendly, healthy competition. May the best one win. Uh, perhaps they have some experts, some cybersecurity experts, maybe some data mining experts, whatever. Um, it could be that they have one special team focusing on the customer experience who can help them to run minimal viable products with existing customer base of the larger enterprise, for example, and monitor that, uh, that things go well. Um, and probably there are shared services underneath because I have seen such incubators and often they have a, a separate team offering services and help and mentoring and, and whatnot to, to the startup teams. And the last example, this is an actual uh, case study that I just published a couple of weeks ago of a pipe drive. They are a CRM company in Tallinn, Estonia. And they have something interesting. Uh, they have what they call mission teams. Those are the yellow ones, except for the one at the bottom, which is called the launch pad. And what they do is they uh, 
the, the launch pad does um, maintenance and small issues on, on a code base in what they call a tribe. And the tribe is around 20-ish people. And then they have temporary mission teams to get larger feature sets created, developed, and integrated in the larger code base. But these are temporary. And there's a continuous rotation of team members between the launch pad and the mission teams. If you've been on the launch pad for too long, you are expected to go on one of the next missions to create another feature, another uh, um, feature set, perhaps. And then if you've been on missions for too long, you're supposed to go back to the launch pad and do maintenance for a while. So this is a very healthy dynamic of sometimes you do missions, sometimes you protect um, the, uh, the, uh, the existing code that we already have. And together, there are usually about two or three missions going on per tribe. They have 17 tribes like this. Um, and uh, those 20 people are then together responsible for the same code base. I love this example because it is for me a new way of showing how you can do dynamic reteaming with a small number of people, 20-ish people responsible for the same code, but then they know when they are on a mission, when they do maintenance, uh, and, uh, and that works really well for them, uh, they, they told me. This is the generic picture that I use for marketing. Uh, there's lots more to tell you about uh, the, the, the patterns that I have in the unfixed model. Uh, that's, um, I need a, a, an initial an hour and a half because <laughs> uh, things are growing and evolving. But the thing I want you to get away from this is it's all options. There is nothing mandatory. Unlike with frameworks, such as the scaled agile framework, where the agile release train is mandatory, it is essential. Uh, uh, Scrum has, is a framework because it has essential practices. Um, I want to have a pattern library, basically, a pattern library for organizational structure. And this is the first set of patterns that I found, all of them borrowed from other sources. Um, some already popular, some not popular yet, but I think valuable and uh, cohesive with, with the other ones. And um, yeah, things will keep evolving. And my hope is that people create awesome designs with, their, with this set of, of, of uh, elements or, or patterns. If you want to know more, go to unfix.work. I have a community there interested in, in, uh, in this experimenting, creating their own designs. And uh, I hope that this could become uh, a, a complementary model uh, uh, or a set of uh, uh, patterns that you can use beside safe or less or whatever else it is that you're using. So that is the short introduction. And uh, I'm sure some of you have questions. So let yeah. me stop sharing the screen. I can share, reshare if needed, but uh, let's yeah. go. So I can, uh, so thank, thanks a lot for the uh, introduction, uh, Jurgen. It was very clear to me at least. Um, I can imagine that people have some questions. So uh, let's first um, share, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, let's let's take about one minute to, uh, to give you the opportunity to uh, think about a question, formulate it in your mind and then transfer it into uh, something tangible in the chat. Then roughly after one minute, we'll see what appeared. And then I'll leave it up to Jurgen to select the questions that, uh, and maybe to uh, pick an order that makes most sense in, uh, in explaining things. So let's just take uh, one minute to formulate a question if you have any. And if you prefer just to listen, that's totally fine as well. I see some good questions already. Uh, 
So shall we just begin? Yeah, and if you like Jurgen, I'm always totally fine if uh, the person raising the question also asks the question, maybe he or she wants to give it a bit more context, but I leave it up to you, Jurgen, to maybe uh, draw attention to the question you would like to start with. Yeah, so um, some questions are completely clear, others um, are, might need a bit of explanation. Um, the first one I saw, um, Alexandra, she asked, is it possible to describe the last bit, this last slide a bit more? What do the letters stand for? Um, well, as I said, I would need another hour probably to explain everything. Um, but for your this specific question, the letters, I will share um, my screen uh, once more to show you those uh, letters indeed. Oh, one minute. I stopped the slideshow. Yeah, there we are, sharing. Okay, so you see the letters um, M, I, A, and D. Um, I have been inspired by um, the, uh, the Horizons model. I think it is from McKinsey, uh, could be another consultancy company where they say you develop new product with certain horizons, horizon one, horizon two, horizon three. And one agile consultant said to me, well, actually, there's also Horizon Zero that's uh, keeping your current product up and running. <laughs> so I turned that into four letters. That's actually the same Horizon. Uh, zero, the, the M, the letter M is of maintenance. That's in this picture, there's one team that doing maintenance exclusively in, of a certain uh, product. The, uh, the other yellow team does uh, the I and the A, that's the improvements and the additions. That's uh, horizon one and horizon two. Horizon one is small changes for the near future. Horizon two is the midterm as the larger feature sets that you are adding. And then the last one, horizon three, is the truly disruptive stuff. That's the letter D. And very often the experts say you don't want teams to be responsible for both uh, improvements and disruption because you cannot disrupt a thing that you are is improving at this at the same time those are very different responsibilities so uh, in this picture the d is a responsibility for the governance group uh, they might delegate that to another uh, tribe or another base as i as i call it but um so this connects to the horizons model horizon zero one two and three and it's I use that as an annotation because it clarifies where do we do the maintenance, where do we do the small improvements, where do we do the larger new feature sets, and where is the truly disruptive new thing happening. If you don't have a letter D somewhere in your company, you have a problem <laughs> because you need to have uh, something disruptive going on. Perfect. Thank you a lot. And what are the numbers for uh, five and nine were about? That's life cycle stages. Uh, I wrote about okay. life cycle stages in my startup scale up screw up book. Um, so there's a blog post about it. Uh, same thing, I use it as annotation and say, well, this part of our code base is, is mature. It's in life cycle stage seven, eight. This part is new stuff that we're running MVPs about it. That means it's in, in stage three or four. Um, so it's annotation of, of your Perfect. Model. Thank you a lot. Sure. Let's see what else did we got. Um, I'm trying to not lose well because the, the chat keeps uh, running. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you say this is Sven. You say that the part of them all are not mandatory. Is there any minimum you need to use? Um, Sven asks that. This the question is clear for you. Um, I don't think there's a minimum. Um, I think you can start anywhere. That's at least my hope that people start with who are the who who did, who's the innovator and the early adopters. I get the question sometimes: Where do we start? Well, with the innovators and early adopters. You don't start in a specific part of your company. You start with those who are most enthusiastic, that certain people, and they could be anywhere. So it could be that the first thing you do is you make a guild or a forum, as I call it. Ta -da, you have your first uh, it could be that you have some scrum teams already okay great that's your starting point then you start it there um so it's not like safe 
or something that you need to have <laughs> set in, in place. Can we uh, sh uh, shut the one who is making a lot of noise? Uh, body? Yeah. I think I've done that by now, yeah. Um, so there's no minimal structure that is necessary as uh, as a yeah as a minimal set because then it becomes a framework. If if you if you have a minimal set of practices that need to be in place, then it's not a pattern library anymore. Then it is a framework, and then that minimal set is is your framework basically. Okay, thank you. Clear. Yost, you have a uh, question about being descriptive or prescriptive. I'm muting. I think that question is similar, uh, right? Um, so <laughs> skip to the next section. Yeah, um, it's similar, indeed, similar but not the same. Um, I think it's 90% descriptive and 10% prescriptive. And what I like is the analogy of using Lego. Uh, you can build lots of things with Lego and uh, you can use Lego to uh, mimic all kinds of things, whether it's spaceships or houses or people. So in that sense, Lego is descriptive. You can use Lego to describe something, mm -hmm. but the Lego blocks can only be connected in certain ways. So it's, uh, there's, it, you cannot make a perfect replica of something else because it doesn't have round, <laughs> round yeah. things. That's the, that's a nice thing about Lego, actually. <laughs> that makes it so cool to play with. Um, I, that is also by design in, in the unfixed mode. There are, you can build lots of things, but not everything. And that should be the case that you cannot, I hope that you cannot build bad stuff. Uh, with traditional hierarchies that's not that's not what i want <laughs> so the model yeah. does not does not allow you for example to have a manager in a scrum team i, I will not have a pattern for that <laughs> because i consider that a bad practice so yeah. you can't build. so the building blocks come with constraints and then you put them together in any way you want but so you can say actually the constraints make it a little bit prescriptive like we, are, we nudge you in that direction and away from that direction yeah yeah that kind of makes sense and of course we can still discover to get a new lego bricks uh yeah. but yeah. we try to keep them to a minimum for a start and at least these ones we we uh we are agreed upon let's use these yeah exactly yeah so what i see now is i have a good starting set i can say like the first lego set is 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 pretty good i think i can build lots of things with it probably more stuff will be added maybe different annotation symbols also useful uh, so it will evolve and that's fine um mm. but it is it should be mostly descriptive and to a little extent prescriptive because we want to nudge people in the good direction and away from a bad direction it's nice that you said that you cannot build something bad out of it. So if you would try to model your current organization or your current department, it might be that with, with your set, uh, this Lego set, that you might run into uh, problems like, hey, I can't model this. And actually, yep. there's a reason for it. It, exactly. it might be an anti-pattern that you hit upon. And that is, um, well, that's actually why I am doing case studies now with several companies trying to draw how they are structured. And, and I come across differences, like things that I cannot draw with unfix now. And that leads me to two possibilities. Either I need new elements or they mm. do something wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, or the truth could be a bit in the middle. Like you cannot draw a matrix organization right now with the unfix models. And uh, that is intentional because I am against matrix organizations. Uh, so for now, you can't do that. You will have to break the Lego bricks <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. to do that if you want. All right, thanks. All right. Um, sure. Richard Metcalf, why unfixed? Does the name have any value in itself? Uh, you asked. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm 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 hearing the uh, the value emerging as as you're talking, and um, yeah. So I think I can answer the question for myself, but I'd be interested to hear your answer. 
Of course. Well, actually, very few people ask this, so I, I love that the question comes up. Um, uh, um, I'm a sticker for words. I love words. I'm a writer. Um, and one thing that SAFE has done well is they chose a really good name <laughs> for their framework, SAFE. <laughs> it makes the target audience feel safe. That's, that is the intention of that word. And um, so I can compliment them for that. Um, and I thought, I want a word that is similarly interesting, that is marketable, that makes people curious. Um, and I played with letters and I had the F from framework, but I didn't want to be at framework. So un F. And then I thought, okay, what else do I have? Experience is a core thing in, in the, the model. So that's the letter X, so the employee experience and the customer experience and the supplier experience. So I had an F and an X and I thought, oh, well, fix, unfix. Oh, that sounds cool. Then I can use that in, in my language. Like, let's start unfixing companies. Let's start unfixing the crap <laughs> that they have. And then, then I thought, that's it. That's the word that I want. I can use it as a verb and as a noun. And, uh, and, and it's fun and it makes people curious. Mm, thank you. Yeah, clear. And some insights there too. Thanks. Cool. Francesca, look, Francesca already used it as a verb. Would you consider unfixing similar emergent practice? So please, <laughs> yeah, um, similar to what you said, I, I really like to struggle with words and use them in this sense. So um, you, you, in, in part, you already answered my question. Let me rephrase it a little bit. So you, you're offering building blocks so that we can develop our own models based on the models that are very popular. And um, I use the word emergent practice there, which I think is always very um, important not to have, you know, this model, we need to use this definitely. And you sort of providing building blocks and, and the library to help everybody um, develop their own way. And you would probably also be open to, as they, in the example you gave us, um, to find new models that emerge from uh, using your building blocks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, what I what I am will be doing for probably the rest of this year is just trying to draw things with the building blocks I already have, um, and I do that. I will do it with case studies, looking at actual companies, and that, that will lead to some additions, I'm sure, uh, to the model. Um, like for example, my my study of, of pipe drive have led me to the conclusion that there is a difference between a, a team or a crew, as I call them, and their turf, their, their territory that they are responsible for. Like very often in the agile world, the assumption is that the, the team, the agile team has its specific area that they work on. And then another team has another area. Uh, and that's how we divide the teams, one team, one product area. But it doesn't have to be like that. You can decouple that is what pipe drive has, has, has made me realize. And then if you have three or four teams operating in the same territory, then reteaming becomes very easy because together they are responsible for that code base. The result is you don't, you cannot make the number of people too large because then uh, the uh, uh, team uh, cognitive load gets too large. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are, you could have 20 ish people is what they discovered at pipe drive and up to that number, it works. And that, and that's really good for employee experience that they can work yeah. on different things within the same territory. So that's, yes. that led to the int introduction of the turf concept, the territory, the domain that teams are responsible for, and either it is equal to the team or it can be equal to the base, the tribe, or something in between. That's a design choice. And I want that to, to be an explicit design choice of the organization designer. Yeah. Instead of having this assumption that we have never questions of team equals turf, that is an assumption. Um, can you clarify your use of the words territory and turf, because I've really found that example particularly interesting. And so, so you're saying they're working on the same territory, yeah. but within that, when they move out of the 
territory? Is would that would, would you, is, is that a turf within the territory? No, uh, I use it as a synonym. Okay. Turf, territory synonym. And and when Just, they go to their subgroups, or you know, do you have a term for that? Is it like a, um, a, a temporary specialization on the within the territory? No, I haven't gone that far yet, mm -hmm. uh, to be honest. I just recognize that at Pipe Drive, the turf is basically at the level of the tribe, not at the level of the team. And it makes it very easy for them to do reteaming within the tribe because they have relatively small tribes and together they are responsible for that code area. Um, so that's an example of something that I realized by holding up the model against an actual company and then, oh, this is, this is super interesting. Um, this has led to a new Lego block. Um, I want to do that with another, I don't know, 10 companies more. That will be a, a return on, a, a, um, what is it? The, the law of diminishing returns. <laughs> the more companies I look at, the fewer things I will find probably. But I also want to look at other models. I mean, there is good stuff in, in save or less or even holacracy, uh, despite that I hate it so much. Uh, it has a couple of good suggestions. Um, and uh, so I, I need to hold the model up against those alternative frameworks and models and whatnot. Uh, to see if there's something else that we can borrow because I credit all my sources. Everything is borrowed from other sources and I credit them on the website. And I, I, want, I just want a more cohesive, complete organization design um, toolbox because to be honest, none of the frameworks do organization design well. They, they all do it incomplete. They only look at the IT part, no suggestions for HR, marketing whatsoever. All of that is left, they're left to their own devices. I, I want to unfix that problem. Well, it Thanks might relate to uh, Jurgen to the questions that Rafael and Rajesha, I hope I pronounced it correctly, have. I think both of them are more focused on so, what problem um, do we try to solve with this model? Yeah, Rafael, you want to add something to the question? or? I, don't hear. Oh, I was so I was wondering uh, what was the reason behind what how do you want to fit this into into the other you know frameworks and and what, what was the general concept of what was the general idea or the reason behind yeah what you were trying to good, to a good of course well um, I I do see how much the scaled agile framework is hated in the community it it has a, a net promoter score of minus 56 I saw recently. It has good stuff uh, in it, um, but it has become bloated and uh, some people compared to the Borg of Star Trek assimilating everything. Um, that's not the direction that I want to go. And um, basically they try to be everything for everyone and still not be complete in any specific area. So I thought, let's just, let's only focus on how to design your organization. That is a concrete pain and not even safe as a complete uh, a suggestion for that. That includes finance and marketing and uh, customer support or whatever. So let's, let's do that first, have something complete that is cohesive, um, that does not just uh, contain everything but the kitchen sink and then have internal contradictions, which is a problem in, in SAFE, because SAFE has four different iterative cycles, for example. It's, just, it's insane. Um, so I wanted to solve that problem. Like We don't have anything that tells you how to do organization design well. We do have holacracy and sociocracy. Some people like it, but for most organizations, they are not an option. They are too extreme, too radical, um, not an option for the average manager out there who wants to start with something that does not look so dangerous as uh, signing away all your author authority <laughs> to some constitution. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, yeah, that was my, my, my mission. And then you said Barry Rayesha had a similar question. Yeah, I think it's related. Yeah. So 
Is it the answer thanks. already, Rachel? Do you want to add some things to that to this? No, I got it. Uh, thanks a lot. All right. Good. Two questions yeah. in one. Awesome. I see Domas is the next one in the chats. Uh, launch, uh, how frequently teams should change? Um, well, that's an entirely different topic, uh, dynamic reteaming. There are so many options. Uh, and here I am indebted to uh, Heidi Helfen, who wrote a great book on the topic, dynamic reteaming. Um, <clears throat> she offers various examples. One example is from Redgate Software, that where they do reteaming once per year. And it is all optional. Uh, people can choose themselves if they want to join another team. And about one third of people decide to work somewhere else. And they have a big annual day for that reserved. Um, and it's great for people's personal development and, and, and et cetera, because they can learn new technologies if they so desire. Velocity drops a little bit but not too much for the next two weeks. Customers don't really notice that the teams have reformed. That's one option. On the other extreme, we find Tesla. Tesla does reteaming every three hours. Imagine that every three hours, people work on another team in a Tesla factory. Uh, Joe Justice has some webinars on it. He is very well known in the agile community. He has worked at Tesla plants and he says it's insane, but it works. And learning goes through the roof because within a couple of weeks, you've worked with everyone in the entire, ma uh, in the entire manufacturing plant. And um, <clears throat> so it's super easy to get teams organically formed and people decide for themselves what thing they work on with whom it is all self-organized. In the middle, between those extremes, you have quite a few other options. Uh, pipe drive does reteaming whenever the mission is over and the missions on average take a couple of weeks but sometimes they can take a couple of months they don't want them too long uh, their sweet spot is maybe between four to six weeks i understand and then the people are supposed to be done with their mission and either join another mission or go back to the launch pad so that's a, a frequency that sits somewhere in between I know um, Willem Jan Ageling of the Serious Scrum blog with his Fluid Scrum teams, he does reteaming every sprint. That's, I assume, either every week or every two weeks, I'm not sure. But every sprint, every, every sprint they have multiple sprint goals. Um, it is one group of 40, 50 people, I think. So that's a rather large turf, I would call it. They mix uh, and match depending on the sprint goals that are offered for the next sprint and decide who wants to work on this sprint goal and this sprint goal in a sort of open space kind of ritual. So every two weeks, um, every sprint, the teams have a different combination, but they work on one larger thing together. So it's one turf of, you could say, 40, 40 people. So many options. Um, there's no one best way of doing it. I suggest that you look at the various ways and, and make up your mind what, be, what would be useful for you. The only thing I suggest with Unfix is do consider it. Do consider not having static teams as is suggested, for example, by less large scale scrum. They specifically say on the website, uh, ideally you should have teams that are together eternally. That does not make sense to me. That, that's not good for the employee experience. I would like to work with other people every now and then. I don't want some method or framework telling me that the best thing for you is not to quit your team. That, that sounds not, not like a kind of place where I would like to work. So just make it as a, a, a default assumption. That's why I like the word crew over team. You're on a mission. The mission could take a couple of weeks, could take a year, maybe two years. At some point, you're done. You should move to another mission, perhaps with another crew. The reteaming should be somewhere in the DNA, as, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, thanks, Jurgen. Great explanation. Perfect metaphors. Good luck. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Philip. Philip Lauzon. Yep. 
Uh, how do you foresee company using uh, Unfix? Like, like as you, you wrote about a bunch of blogs and article about like like modeling companies. Is it like a thing, a type of plug and play? There's a model, a library, and I can try some uh, with my company, or more like different patterns that may be a tool to develop and organize the, some of the pattern. Uh, how do you see the future for Unfix? Yeah, good question. I think uh, the Unfix model is is itself uh, still trying to figure out what it wants to be uh, in a sort of existential uh, <laughs> um, uh, 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 no man's land. It could go in various directions. Um, for now, I have the, the Miro template that I need to update, by the way, but there is a template that people can use to do their own designs. I will probably upload also a PowerPoint version for people to play with. Uh, so just the Lego box. I want to offer the Lego box. Go and play, <laughs> be inspired, um, and start somewhere. Um, what I also want to do is offer specific scenarios, and I could call them uh, safe unfixed or less unfixed or, uh, or something like that, like sort of add-ons or extensions to the frameworks where I say, well, it's all very nice what you're doing, but I have some additional patterns for specifically your organization design, things that you're missing. So you could unfix those with this collection of scenarios or something. Um, that's what I want to do. Uh, that's uh, very high on my wish list, to be honest. Um, and um, who knows? Maybe some people step forward and say, hey, this looks like something I could uh, uh, make a tool out of so people can do the drawing on their computer. I don't have that talent, but. Uh, uh, we would be welcome, uh, things like that. It could go in, in various directions. Um, the point is, it's a pattern library. Um, I am so old that I remember that the uh, design patterns book by the Gang of Four a couple of decades ago was very popular among software engineers. <laughs> they taught us uh, the patterns such as the Singleton and the Model View Controller and various others that have become common. Uh, terms across software engineers ever since that book came out. Um, my hope is that something like that will happen. It's just a starting point of uh, organizational patterns that make sense. You use whatever you want in your context. It's not the point to use them all. Then you haven't understood the concept of pattern library. <laughs> Actually, that ha did happen a couple of decades ago that some people tried to make architectures, including all the patterns from the design patterns book. And then some were like, oh my God, <laughs> you don't understand the concept of patterns. You're turning it into a framework. <laughs> um, so yeah, it could go in various directions. Uh, put it. Ooh, thanks. Okay. Then, um, are we there yet? No, I see something from James. Uh, yeah, more comments. I think Richard, uh, do, do you have another question, uh, Richard? Or Yeah, I do, I do have another one. Um, I'm, I have to leave in a couple of minutes, so I might not be around for all of the answer, but <laughs> anyway, I'll throw it out. Um, yeah, I really like the, the idea of the pattern framework. That's really kind of landing with me as to what this, this adds, um, and I really, really like it. And it got me to thinking about, well, what sort of patterns are these? Um, so that that's kind of the, the question that's under my question, but then also looking at, you know, you've alluded to sociocracy and the pattern, you know, the sociocracy also has and can be used as a, as a pattern library as well. And I'm I just kind of wondered, looking at the different types of crew that you're identifying here, I started to wonder, are there different types of patterns within those types of crews that might be more appropriate or might be more effective? thinking of the crews as and these patterns as attractors in the kind of complexity sense and whether there are we can already look forward and say okay what are once we have these attractors there are there different types of things that could be used to enhance the effectiveness when people start to gather in these in these patterns in these forms i don't know if that mm. makes sense but i was just kind of riffing a bit yeah, um, well, a, a couple of things, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I have um, uh, I have a different opinion about the word attractors <laughs> uh, than other people, because uh, attractors in complexity science are, are, are um, uh, uh, structures that you inevitably end up with. 
like uh, the matrix organization seems to be an attractor <laughs> because many companies end up with a matrix organization. So that seems to be an undesirable attractor, one that we should set, try to break up. Um, but whether they are attractors or not, um, I think um, um, there, some are different patterns, some are just flavors of patterns. Like I have the facilitation crew, the experience crew and the partnership crew. Those might actually be three flavors of the same kind that's possible. So I, things will evolve. And I'm already thinking maybe the facilitation crew should be split in facilitation and coordination because those are two different things. But you can easily get, get get carried away with all the options that 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 you you recognize in companies, and before you know it, the Lego box has thousand different kinds of pieces, and then it becomes too complicated for people to use. Uh, and the only already thing have that. Build, yeah, and the only thing you can build is Harry Potter yeah. castle. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I already have that that criticism, but some people say, oh, this looks too complicated. Um, it needs to be simplified. Well, um, the smartphone is complicated on the inside, for sure. Uh, so there's a difference between how things are presented versus how things are constructed on the inside. And yes, I have definitely, I could simplify the way I communicate things on the website and everything. I do not believe that the toolbox itself should be simplified. Because uh, look at my kitchen back home. I have five different, no, seven different knives, many different spoons, lots of different pans and pots. It's very complicated, <laughs> the tool set that I have. Because <laughs> um, if you only have one type of knife, you cannot be a chef, really. <laughs> this is very, very difficult. So you need options. As a, as a decent professional, you need a tool set that you can that actually using complexity science that has the, 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 the minimum num amount of variety to deal with the variety in the environment outside. That's the law of requisite variety, they, they call it. So the tool set needs to have enough options to deal with a rather complex environment to, to be able to handle most things. Not all of it, but most. Yeah. And I keep that aside. Yeah, keep that as simple as possible, as Einstein said. Make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. <laughs> no. Thank, you. Thank you. So we're moving into the closing part of this interview already. Uh, I think a good starting point, if people are interested in learning more, is the Unfix website. Um, it is uh, <clears throat> yeah. shared in the Google presentation. I think you also shared the link. Um, are there other Unfix. ways uh, for people to engage or contribute or learn more that you want to explain you um other things that i want to explain more well we have a, I have a community no i mean so if people are interested in, in in using this or if people are interested in 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 uh well uh maybe learn more uh, about this model or be, become a partner because i read something on your website about there are, there's an option to become a partner or something like that I'm not sure if that's something that you yeah, want to draw yeah. attention to or well, um, thank you for mentioning. What I don't want is uh, certified unfixed professionals and that kind of crap. Uh, so there will not be certification programs, um, but uh, this needs funding of some kind because bills need to be paid. So I have simple partnerships. Those who want direct access to me with personal conversations, discussions about their clients, they can have a partnership. Uh, and uh, and that's how I fund uh, all this all this stuff. And uh, I make courseware materials uh, available, workshops. Those will also be available for partners. They can do with it whatever they want. Um, and I will be running my own workshops uh, for those interested after the summer is the first uh, uh, real unfixed foundation, I call it. But no, there will be no certified uh, practitioner kind of things. Uh, that's um, I, I don't want to go that way. Uh, anything else, Jurgen, that you would like to share? Um, no, that's it. I hope people found this interesting. Uh, feel free to keep the conversation going with me on the community and um, things will evolve. So uh, by the end of the year, things will look different from now. I'm pretty sure so that will only be cool.
Cool. So thanks a lot, Jorgen, again, for uh, taking your time. And also, uh, well, you are on a vacation right now. So highly appreciate that uh, you took some time to, uh, to still, uh, well, do this online meetup. Um, this is an excellent moment for everyone that, uh, that needs to go and, uh, and want, wants to stick to a one hour session. If you would like to uh, hang around for another, let's say roughly 10 minutes to uh, in a very lightweight debrief this session, then uh, uh, feel free to hang around a bit longer. And Jürgen, it's completely up to you what you want to do. I can totally understand if you want to enjoy your- uh... Hang around for a little bit, yeah. Ah, cool. So this is the waving part. Just gonna wave. <laughs> <laughs> so that you don't Thanks feel awkward leaving. Thank you. I'll stop recording.